Okay, we're exploring a whole new section now in, in uh, Ezekiel. The first three chapters were the call of the prophet. Then we had 20, uh, through, uh, right through chapter 24, detailed judgments that were coming upon Jerusalem. There were three sieges involved. Nebuchadnezzar's first siege took Daniel as a hostage and put a vassal king in charge. They didn't behave themselves, so Nebuchadnezzar had a second siege during which he took some more captives, including Ezekiel, and put a different king in charge. And it's that interval between the second and third siege that occupies the first 24 chapters of this book as Ezekiel tries to explain to his people who are in Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, as Jeremiah simultaneously is trying to preach in Jerusalem that what's going on is God's judgment, that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is God's instrument. Well, in Jerusalem they throw Jeremiah in prison, and both Jeremiah and Ezekiel have the burdensome task of trying to convince the, the uh, children of Israel that God's judgment is upon them. And if they don't behave, it's going to get worse. Jerusalem is going to get, it's not just subject, it's, but it's still extending. The people in Jerusalem are going to suffer death because they're going to level the place if they don't behave. And they don't behave. That's the third siege. So the first 24 chapters occur, or given, prior to the, that final third siege of Jerusalem. During the interval, Ezekiel is not to talk at all. He's, he's ordered to be dumb, quiet, about, any, about anything having to do with, with uh, Jerusalem. In lieu of that, his focus is shifted, God's focus through him is shifted, on the judgment of the Muslim nations that surround Jerusalem. And uh, they, were, uh, they turn out, with 2020 hindsight, to realize they were all Muslim nations. In any case, God's judgment on that, that occupied that heavy period from 20, chapter 25 through 32. Then the siege occurs. After the siege, we have the rest of the book. So we're going to see a change of, a shift of gears, so to speak, as we move into chapter 33. So we were, we've spent the last number of weeks in the judgment of the nations. We're now shifting where the theme is the restoration of Israel. Not just locally then, although that's part of it, because they know, you know their captivity will be coming to an end. They're only being a captivity for a total of 70 years. But much, you will discover the language gets much, much broader. And, uh, we're, and uh, so we're, they're, they're going to return to the land here. Okay. So understand that Ezekiel was forbidden to speak to his people anymore about any of that until he got the message that Jerusalem had indeed fallen. When it finally falls, and by the way, that was a seven-year period. If you like to deal in seven-year prophecies, a lot of people like to deal with that, okay. Um, that silence was imposed on Ezekiel for seven years. Meanwhile, he spoke prophecies of judgments on the surrounding nations, as we've seen in the last half a dozen chapters. So we're in 33, which is sometimes called the Watchman chapter. He's given a slightly different assignment, and this is more of a pastoral kind of assignment here. Ezekiel 33, verse 1, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. See, he's going to revert here. Uh, God reverts to the commission that he gave Ezekiel at the very beginning of his ministry. And he likens him here to like a watchman. The, the guy that's on the wall. The guy that's, uh, you know, watching for the arrival of an enemy from, on, on the ramparts. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people... Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. In other words, if you get the message and you don't honor it, then you, that's, your own pro that's your problem. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and he took not warning, his, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Wow. 
Wow. Many people apply that to witnessing. So your job isn't, to, his, isn't his decision. Your job is to make sure that he had an opportunity. How he deals with that opportunity is, is on his head if you've been diligent in witnessing. If you fail to witness, people would argue that that puts the burden on you for not having witnessed. In the Old Testament, the watchman role is all through the Old Testament. Second Samuel 8, and you can get the list from your notes, but sounding the trumpet is a, was a, is a quaint Old Testament phrase, but Paul uses it, that same idiom, in a slightly different context, in a spiritual context, it, re, regarding uh, spiritual gifts and witnessing, which we should be more concerned with. 1 Corinthians 14, 8 being the reference, that uh, if it's an uncertain sound, who's going to respond, see? Let's move on. Verse 7. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. That's the predicament that Ezekiel's been in all along, but it's being re-emphasized here. Ezekiel fulfilled that commission. Ezekiel had warned them. The false prophets had told the opposite. But see, this is, this is, this is the, the time marker here is Jerusalem has fallen. The word's finally gotten to the community there that Ezekiel's with that the, the, the city's been burned. It's over. All the false prophets that were saying, no, God's going to save us and so forth, were wrong. So this, at this point, they clearly know that Ezekiel is indeed the prophet that God had called. Up till now, big debate, and they were arguing about it. Well, exactly what Ezekiel has been hammering away happened. So he's been, he's been endorsed, if you will, and he did a good job. He was, he, he was very diligent. He had probably one of the strangest ministries we find in the Bible. Daniel had a very glamorous one, but he was in, at court all the time. Ezekiel has got these weird skits and these, these bizarre antics that God has him do to get the message across. A, a, a tough, tough, tough bit. And so anyway, the prophet now receives new appointments as the watchman of the people. And that's analogous to a lot of places all through the Old Testament. We don't have to go travel that ground, I don't think. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Tough spot to be in. Tough spot to be in. See, we need to make sure, if, to the extent there's a parallel with us here, that the fellow who hears us has been properly warned. We're not responsible for his decision. He is. We're responsible to make sure that he's warned. If he's not warned, the speaker is held responsible. He will have to answer to God for neglecting his duty. Ooh, heavy stuff. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. So that's the, that's the predicament that the witness has. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? And by the way, there's a parallelism here to Leviticus 26 that's so striking that we ought to just take a look at a, a parallel passage here, just four verses. Leviticus 26, starting about verse 39. They that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, with their trespass which they trespassed against me, and that also that they have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. And so it, it's a very similar passage. Back to Ezekiel 33. We're down to verse 11, chapter 33. God continues uh, with uh, instructing Ezekiel. He says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? 
God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's quite obvious from this verse that God does not want to judge. Isaiah uses a strange phrase. He says that judgment was his strange work. You'll find that in Isaiah 28, verse 21. God wants to save them, and he is urging them to turn to him and accept life. That's basically his premise here. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. What he's really saying here, in effect, that all the good deeds you might do will not compensate for your bad deeds. And that indeed is true. That's why we all need a Savior, but that's later. To have adequate righteousness before God, you have to be blameless. Now, insert our perspective now. We are declared blameless because God has found one, developed one, that has taken all our guilt for us. That does God a big favor. It gives him the opportunity to pardon us because the thing's already been paid. He's, he can do that without compromising his righteousness. That's what we mean by redemption. Getting back to this, he that is guilty of one fault is guilty of all. Consider your righteousness like a chain. If one link breaks, it no longer holds you. The chain of righteousness must have all the links effective. That's what the epistle of James hammers eloquently in the New Testament, applying to the New Testament period. God says, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. This is the same idea said in another way. You have to stand in God's righteousness, and that comes about through repentance and taking refuge in his mercy, not by standing in your own righteousness. That's as clear as I think I can express it. Whatever you have done that is noteworthy before the Lord is not enough to offset your shortcomings, your iniquities, whatever. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge and give again that which he'd robbed and walked in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Yet the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. See, the children of Israel had another complaint. They said that God was not fair in his judgment. He judged everybody alike. Yet there were some good people among the captives. That's their complaint. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. And this, by the way, so you don't misunderstand any of this, the verse is not talking about somebody losing salvation. It's a whole different subject. God is saying that when one of his children gets into sin, he will judge him, and that is exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.31. God also says through John, there is a sin unto death, 1 John 5.16. He's speaking about a child of God. What kind of death is he talking about? He's talking about physical death, not spiritual death here. Some Christians are judged for their sins by physical death. You'll find that in the Scripture. Strange idea, not, not, not to confuse the two. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. See, God is righteous in what he does. If a wicked, a wicked man will turn to God, God will save him. Whoever you are, um, uh, you will have to stand before God for judgment someday. If you are a child of God, he will judge you for the sins you've committed, but you will not lose your salvation. That's, a, that's exactly, we all, all of us, saved or unsaved, will stand before, uh, well, I shouldn't put it that way, that's not right. If you're saved, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And the procedure is detailed for you in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 to 15. Because you will be judged, uh, your, 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 your guilt has been taken away, you're declared not guilty because of the completed work of Christ. But behavior still matters. You have the opportunity for inheritance and rewards, and that's a whole study that we won't try to rebuild right here. But if you're a lost person, you have no claim on God whatsoever. 
Whole different program. And he's made that clear in the New Testament. 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So that's a, the same thought in a New Testament idiom, if you will. Let's move on back to 21. Verse 21, It came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came to me, saying, The city is smitten. And by the way, it took him six months to get from Jerusalem to bring the message to Ezekiel and, 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 and the people in Babylon. And... Uh, the city is smitten. This is the event when they finally learn, okay, it's over. That changes, that, that empowers Ezekiel in this whole new program. On the very day that this news was brought, to Ezekiel's wife died, and he was prohibited to mourn for her. If you remember that we went through all of that in chapter 24, 16 to 24. There are some dating issues here in terms of the dates that mentioned here, because it says the twelfth year, tenth month, fifth day. If you read the Masoretic text, which is the, taken from, the, the, the fugitive reached exile one and a half years after the fall of Jerusalem. That was hard to explain. You find the books are full of trying to explain all that. Jeremiah's year, as he reckons it, began in the autumn, while Ezekiel, following the Babylonian reckoning, began the year in the spring. Thus the eleventh year of Jeremiah 39.2 is the same as the twelfth year of Ezekiel 33.21. So the news that reached Ezekiel in January of the year 585 B.C. Jerusalem fell in the eleventh year, fourth month, and ninth day of the reign of Zedekiah, according to Jeremiah 39.2, which parallels other Jeremiah passage in 2 Kings. And it was burned a month later, that's Jeremiah 52, verses 12 to 14, and parallels 2 Kings 25, verses 8 to 10. Eight manuscripts, the, the Septuagint and several others, um, read the eleventh year, dating this oracle from the eleventh year, tenth month, fifth day, permits it to fit in to the um, 26, verse 1, uh, which may have been delivered on the 11th or 12th month of the 11th year. The news would have come about six months after the fall of Jerusalem, that is about January 585 B.C. There's a similar parallel event in Ezra's journey of 108 days from Ezra 8 uh, uh, and again 7, 8, 9. So there is all kinds of confusion along the, in the, among the commentaries about this issue. It's obviously not a burning issue from us, but I think it's from digging into this, it seems pretty straightforward to recognize that Jeremiah and Ezekiel are dealing with slightly different calendars. That's, that's, that's no big deal except to be aware of that. Okay, verse 22. Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening afore he that was escaped come. The escapee is about to bring the news, but Ezekiel already has it because the Lord told him about it. Before he was escaped came, and he opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning, and my mouth was open, and I was no more dumb. Seven years of silence is thus broken. See, it was in the evening. Uh, the Lord opened his mouth by the time the man had arrived the next morning, if you will. And he was now free to devote himself to his pastoral work, which was hinted at earlier. Now, this restricted speech thing, you may, see, you may recall in Ezekiel 24, that's where the Lord prophesied that He would be silent to Judah until Jerusalem fell. From that point on, chapters 25 through 33, He had been giving them no prophecy for Jerusalem. Instead, He had given them messages for the surrounding nations. That's what we just went through in those uh, in chapters, uh, in those uh, seven chapters. Or eight chapters, I guess it is, yeah. It's uh, nine chapters. What is it, 25? Yeah, anyway. Seven years passed while he waited for that day that occurs in the next few verses here of 33. And we now find that God no longer makes Ezekiel dumb about Jerusalem. So now he's again allowed to deal with that issue. So then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, so Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many, and the land is given us for inheritance. That's the position that the residents are taking, in effect, that inhabit the, the, the waste that remain. Abraham was what well, one, and he inherited the land, but we are many, and the land is given for us. They believe that they're entitled, they're God's chosen people, they can inherit. That's their position. That's similar to the position they've been taking through the whole siege. They still haven't got the message here. 
They said the land is given us for inheritance. One of the things we need to learn, it's going to be very important for some other things we're going to get into here, is that inheritance is not guaranteed. Inheritance can be forfeit. There's an, inherit, an inheritance you get by birth. You're a son. Uh, uh, you, you're, you have a, uh, your position is inherited. But the rewards the, uh, uh, that may be associated with it have, are rewarded for faithful service, perseverance. Obedience. They're ignoring here the fact that there was a great deal of difference between Abraham and themselves. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6, we all know it. These people do not really believe in God. There's a big difference here. So God continues to instruct. He says, Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, lift up your eyes toward idols, and shed blood, Shall ye possess the land? Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, ye defile every one his neighbor's wife. Shall ye possess the land? He lays out here six major areas that was their practice that was offensive to God. The, um, we go through them all. They were not supposed to eat the blood. They lift their eyes up to idols. That speaks for itself. They shed blood. Possess the land. They stand upon the sword. They, they might makes right kind of attitudes. Ye work abomination. And this is in a verb form. It's a curious construction in the Hebrew because it has a feminine suffix. And scholars wonder what that might be. Was it intentional? Maybe pointing to the uh, uh, prominence of women in that role? Or possibly even degrading vice uh, that may have involved the, the loss of manhood. There's speculations about it. It doesn't really affect anything. There's six specific sins that disqualified them from any inheritance. That's the point God is making here. The inheritance is a reward. It's not a guarantee. Say thou thus unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely they that are in the waste shall fall by the sword. And him that is in the open field will I give to the beasts to be devoured. And they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. See, all those that are hiding in the ruins in the, in the wastelands here, the depopulated countryside, they're going to fall before the, the uh, destructive forces that were mentioned back in chapter 5 and 14 and the earlier stuff. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. And by the way, it has remained desolate up until when? Yeah, exactly right. But now there's something new coming. There's a new wind blowing, and that's what's going to, we're going to start seeing the text as we go forth, the Ruach, if you will. Then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak to one another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. It sounds like they're starting to listen, but they don't really. They listen, but they don't follow through. The people are shook up. Because the unthinkable has happened, Jerusalem has been destroyed. So now they're willing to listen to Ezekiel. But they're not going to follow through. Don't be misled by that. They're hearers only, not doers, is the point. And they come unto thee as the... God's co coaching uh, Ezekiel here. He says, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of us have, are guilty of some of that. See, on the surface they appeared to be turning to the Lord. They wanted to hear what the Lord had to say, but had no intention of obeying Him. They were hearers, but not doers. And if you want the amplify of that, just go to James chapter 1 and take it from there. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. <laughs> pretty, can't improve on that. That's pretty clear. See, unbelief is willful. You need to understand that. Unbelief is willful. 
The real problem is that the people do not want to give up their sin. There's no real issue here of Ezekiel's credentials, not here. He's been saying that for years, and what he said has come true. So he's, his, his credential, he's his credibility is established. That's still not enough, because unbelief is willful. You need to understand that. They were willing to come and listen to what Ezekiel had to say, but it had no effect on their behavior. You know, the thing we should probably put on our dressers is a little sign. Behavior matters. You need to remember that all the way through. Our salvation is paid for by Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. But our behavior still matters, because that's what determines our inheritance. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. I love the way that goes. When this cometh to pass, and lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Ezekiel was the only man who said that Jerusalem would be destroyed. All of the false prophets said that it would not be destroyed. Well, the ballots have been counted, huh? The word of confirmation has come. Jerusalem is destroyed. Ezekiel is thus declared to be the true prophet. So they're without excuse is the point. Okay, that brings us to chapter 34, the wicked shepherds. The false prophets of Israel have now been shown to be liars because of the destruction of Jerusalem as prophesied by Ezekiel has become a reality. And by the way, the concept of a shepherd here, in the, it's an Old Testament phrase, you and I tend to think of Christ as the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, that's valid, don't misunderstand me. But we think of a shepherd as being a pastor, a spiritual leader, because Jesus is indeed our spirit, but he's much more than that. The concept of a shepherd in the Old Testament was a term used um, by, uh, uh, in fact, it's even that way in Homer's Iliad, in other words, of kings, of leaders. Yes, a shepherd, it's shepherd is the analogy, but when they speak of a shepherd, the analogy they're pointing to are the kings and the leadership, not just, the, not, not, not just pastors as we use the term, okay? And Ezekiel will use the term in his thoughts, where clearly he's talking about tyrants, um, you know, rulers of the house of David that were like Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. These were bad, these were bad guys, and, and their lieutenants. You'll even find the Antichrist spoken of as a wicked shepherd in Zechariah 11, 17, the only physical description we have of the Antichrist we, uh, is, is there. So, again, it's a wicked shepherd idiom there. Let's go on with chapter 34. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Now, this is an example where many of us would apply that to pastors too, not just kings. Feed the flocks. See, speaking of the parallel here, they had not given the people the Word of God. That should still be the standard by which we judge a ministry today. Do they feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, ye clothe you with the wool, and ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. See, all of us are needy people, and the only thing that can minister to our deep needs is the Word of God. If a minister is not giving the Word of God, he is not ministering to the people. That's what he's supposed to be all about. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. They became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. The word meat there, by the way, is in the Old English. It really should be translated food in a broader sense. But I think that's most of your sense of that. The unfed sheep will scatter elsewhere. It's interesting. We see that in ministry, too. Unfed, unfed sheep will scatter elsewhere. But there's... A, possessive here that I think is interesting, because God still calls this shambles his flock. He says, yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. See, God never relinquished his right to those that were under the shepherds. They're still his. We need to remember that. 
They're still God's sheep, even if they're mismanaged by the ministers. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became food to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but my shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. And cause them to cease from feeding the flock, neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be food for them, or meat for them. I will deliver my flock. I love that possessive there. See, we're starting to shift now, and you'll begin to sense this, to the messianic period. The, the language here is going far beyond Ezekiel and his contemporaries. The language is going much, with much broader strokes here. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And we're talking here about the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. And if you want the three psalms that deal with that, Psalm 22, 23, and 24. They are a, a triplet, a trilogy, if you will. There are, the, I, God is speaking assertively here. He says, I will, I will, I will. He's going to say that 18 times in 18 verses here. From verses 11, verse 11 through 29. <coughs> I will, I will, I will. God is taking charge. Behold, I, even I, will both search, and I will seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them, and so forth. And I will bring them out of the, from the people, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their own land, and feed them up on the mountains of Israel, by the rivers, and in all the inhabited places of the country. Now this language here goes far beyond their return from Babylon. That, you know, that, that we see chronicled under Ezra and Nehemiah. It includes that, but it's much broader strokes we're dealing with here. The debates about the ultimate return to Israel should have ended on May 14th of 48. Up until then, scholar, Bible scholars argued whether it ever really would happen. They tried to apply this language just to what happened after Babylon. But it's very awkward because it's much broader strokes than that. But those debates should have ended on May 14th, 48th. May Isaiah said, can a nation be born in a day? Yes, it was. Indeed. I will feed them in good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There, there shall they lie in good fold, and in a fat pasture they shall feed upon the mountains of Israel. And this is obviously a future time. See, because the land of Israel is not in safety today. They're there, but they're certainly not in security. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which is lost, and bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken. I will strengthen that which was sick, and I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will feed them in judgment. You can tell that Ezekiel, just like the Lord, has a pastor's heart. The Lord identifies himself as the good shepherd, all through the Old Testament, by the way, and also in the New Testament, the whole... Uh, Chapter 10 of John deals with it, and many other passages, obviously. And of course, all of this is messianic. It gets its fulfillment in the, in, in the uh, kingdom age. It says John 10, verses 14 through 16. I encourage you to read the whole chapter of John 10. We do well read the speaking of the Good Shepherd, which is God. God's, he is referring there to here in Ezekiel 24, the 34. And as for you, my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I judge between the cattle and the cattle and between rams and the he goats. It's an unfortunate translation, actually. The term cattle, is a, it's, it's a term used in the Old Testament of sheep rather than of kind, or, and uh, in Genesis 30 and elsewhere. In fact, in Genesis 30, 32, we have the exact same Hebrew word that Ezekiel uses here. So that's a little misleading. And you can also, in your notes, put uh, Matthew 13, the tares and the wheat. Because they're going to be separated, but they'll be separated at the end, not during. And of course, there's the, in Matthew 25, you've got the judgment of the sheep and the goats that are in, in broad view here. 
Continuing, seemeth it a small thing to you to have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must foul with residue your, with your feet? As for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns till ye have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey and I will judge between cattle and cattle and I will set up one shepherd over them. Oh boy. I will set up what? One shepherd over them. And he shall feed them. Even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. This is one of four places in the book of Ezekiel where the one that is ruling in the kingdom is David himself. Most, many scholars, and they can build a case for this, say, argue that that really is the son of David, Jesus Christ himself. But when we get to chapters 40 and following and really study that period, I'll show you some reasons why that's not likely. And even though most commentators still think that it's going, that the term David here is used uh, uh, idiomatically really of the Lord, the, our King, coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it's interesting that in throughout, from 40 to 48, we hear about the Prince, and the Prince has children, and uh, so on. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, I'm, I'm leaning the other way. I think, I think God means what he says and says what he means. Even my servant David, he shall feed them and shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. And I, the Lord, have spoken it. Boy, it sounds to me like David is distinctive. He's resurrected by then. Why not? Interesting. David, a prince among them. See, the earth is going to be the eternal home of Israel. And it does appear that David will rule here on this earth throughout eternity. He will be a vice regent of the Lord Jesus as our king. Interesting. David is also referred to by name elsewhere in passages that look to the future restoration of Israel. Jeremiah 30 verse 9, Hosea 3 5, and others. However, the other side of this is, Christ as the good shepherd, of course, is in John 10. As the son of David completely fulfills all the promises all through the Old Testament. So there is an argument you can build the other way. And uh, I, want it, I want to be presented that so you can do your own homework, come to your own conclusions. But at this point, I'm beginning increasingly to take it at face value. And I will make them a covenant of peace, and I will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. That's obviously messianic. And I will make them, excuse me, I will, I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his seasons, and there shall be showers of blessing. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. And they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more." A plant of renown. Obviously, from verse 25 on, it's obviously millennial. And it corresponds with Isaiah 65 on the one hand and Revelation 21 on the other. The whole millennial period. Understand the millennium is not a, a limited to the, the insights from Revelation 21. Most of what we know about the millennium comes from Isaiah 65, but most importantly, understand that the millennium is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, an unconditional covenant that's yet future. And it's tragic that most churches, are, because of a position they've adopted, can't deal with it that way. The concept of a plant here is being raised. That was an idiom that Isaiah used when he spoke of a Messiah. He, uh, he spoke to you know, uh, the, the uh, branch 
in Isaiah 11. And uh, Jeremiah 23 speaks of the Messiah as the root out of a dry ground. We have several times he's, this plant uh, idiom is used. The, the branch, the tzemek, it's one of, tw uh, I think, 12 different words that can mean branch, but it's a word that's always used messianically in, in the Hebrew. And, uh, and Jeremiah also uses, uh, you know, speaks of him as a root out of a dry ground and so on. Thus they, shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Wow. This chapter, obviously in the last dozen verses, really sets the stage for our next session, which deals with the restoration of Israel and the valley of the dry bones, the vision of the dry bones, which we're going to deal next time. There is a short chapter still in the way, and that we're going to take right here, chapter 35. We're going to talk briefly here of the judgment of Edom. See, the present oracle is much more detailed than the one we went through in chapter 25. Remember we had uh, verses 12, 13, 14 there. And it was called forth by Edom's hostile behavior of, uh, uh, of Judah right after the, this year's. But Israel, in order to get restored, must be cleared of hostile neighbors before the blessings of the new age can begin. And that's what 30, chapter 36 is going to deal with, the first uh, half a dozen verses. The desolation of Mount Seir, which is an idiom for Edom, if you will, and the restoration of the mountains of Israel form a striking contrast. What we're going to see uh, here is going to be a big contrast to what's coming. More of the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against them. Mount Seir, the word Seir, by the way, means hairy, and it's just covered with brushwood. This is apparently the explanation for the label. But the, there are the highlands east of the Arabah, stretching from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. It's the home of Edom, and uh, all through from Genesis 36 on. And say to it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. When we went through all those seven nations, the Muslim nations, the, one, the, the two that were hit the hardest, most ir ir irrevocably, is Edom and Babylon. But Edom here is uh, the, uh, the traditional enemies of Israel. God says, I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Now, Ezekiel has previously dealt with all of this in chapter 25, but it's being expanded here. Petra and Teman were the main cities of Edom, and, and just as the prophecy indicated, they're now ruins. You go there, they are in ruins. When you go to Petra, it's really worth visiting for some prophetic reasons, but it's in it's ruins. Edom was subjugated by Babylon to begin with, Nebuchadnezzar. Then it was subjugated by the Medo-Persians. And then in 126 BC, the Hasmoneans compelled them to become Jews. So they became known as Idumeans, derived from Edom. But, and of course, Herod was an Idumean. So these are really false Jews in a sense. Because thou hast a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that they of their iniquity had an end, Edom always either fought Israel or cheered their enemies on. When the enemies when, were pillaging um, Jerusalem, the Edomites were on the sidelines saying, bash the heads of their kids against the rocks, and cheering them on. The legacy of hate is deep here. And idiomatically, at least, they are the fathers of all the enemies of Israel. So these are people ascended from Esau, Jacob's brother. Esau was Jacob's bitterest enemy. The people of Edom probably hurt the people of Israel more than any other enemy they've ever had. And Edom represents today, still, the enemy of God in the world today. And we see it every day. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Sith thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. And that's kind of interesting because we have blood there four times. Okay? And blood, Edom, means red. For different reasons, but it does. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off it from him, cut off from it him that passeth out and him that returneth. And I will fill his mountains with his slain men, 
And thy hills and thy valleys and in all thy rivers they shall fall that are slain with the sword. And I will make thee perpetual desolations and thy cities shall not return and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Boy, God's upset. Because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it <laughs> whereas the Lord was there. He's talking about Israel and Jerusalem, the Israel and uh, uh, Judah, the two houses of the nation, Israel. Israel and Judah. Jeremiah 33 does the same thing here. Whereas the Lord was there. See, the Lord had withdrawn His visible presence from the temple and the city, and that's, but He had not renounced His right to the land. That's why I get very nervous as I watch our own administration meddle in the Middle East, because we're poking our finger in the eye of God, in the same sense that Edom did. This prophecy declares a purified Israel shall return, and Jerusalem will be given a new name. And that's going to be dealt with when we get to chapter 48 in Ezekiel. Continuing, therefore I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. And I'll make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given, they are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth have ye boasted against me, and I have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. And you can, and as you read this, just put the word Islam in all those places, and you're not stretching a thing at all. That legacy of hate had, had its roots here. As thou didst rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, on all Idumea, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So we have here in view the, vic the victorious return of Christ. Jesus is the one mighty to save. And this passage is linked to Revelation 19, where the Lord comes riding on a white horse, and his vestures dipped in blood. But it's also covered in Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 63. And I want you to notice that the Lord, when he comes, makes his appearance at his second coming, comes riding from Edom. Well, he's going to be on the Mount of Olives. That's later. Where does he first go? Let's take a look at Isaiah 63, just a couple of verses. Who is this that cometh from Edom? with dyed garments from Basra, or Petra in effect, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness and mighty to save. Who's speaking? Who is mighty to save? Jesus, absolutely right. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. When Jesus opened his ministry in Luke 4, reading from Isaiah at the, in the synagogue of Nazareth, when you read what he read and compare it to Isaiah 61 that he was reading from, you notice that he stopped at a comma. You talk a lot about that. He read right up to a comma, closed the book, and said, This day is this fulfilled in your ears. What's interesting, the part that he didn't read, he left off the last clause, which reads, And the day of vengeance of my God. Does that mean he's not going to fulfill it? No, he is going to fulfill it. Not yet. That comma has lasted about 2,000 years. But he is coming back, and when he comes back, he will come back to Basra, to rescue the remnant that has fleed there. And he's going to wipe out the Muslim horde. The whole scenario of what occurs at the time the Lord returns, you can find in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, if you want to get those details. A prerequisite condition to the second, there's no prerequisite condition of the Harpazo, it could happen any time. But there is a prerequisite condition to the second coming, his returning, and is that, that is that Israel needs to ask him to. They have to petition him to come back. That's in Hosea 5.15. Okay, we're shifting gears from this judgment, judgment, judgment stuff that we've been uh, dealing with up till now because the next chapter starts the uptick, if you will. In our next session, I want you to study carefully two chapters. There's not long chapters. Chapters 36 and 37. 
Chapters 36 describes the reason for Israel's restoration, and the reason will surprise you, because God will hammer away on the fact that they don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. The only reason he's doing it is because his name is on the deal. His reputation is at stake. I, it's for, and I don't do it for your sakes. It's for my name's sake. But then 37 is this famed vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And all of this, of course, is the, is the restoration promises to Israel, which in part have happened, and there's part of it that's still happening, and part of it hasn't happened yet. When we get to chapter 40 to 48, we have the millennium, the millennial temple, and all of that stuff. That's going to be great stuff. Between the Valley of the Dry Bones, the restoration of Israel, and the kingdom, there are two chapters. The best known chapters to most prophecy buffs around. Chapter 38 and 39. And that'll be the time after next, where we'll deal with the Magog invasion that some people think is about to happen. We'll see. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And,